are you? Good. Yeah? Great. Great. Rich started clapping just when I touched the microphone. So let's borrow that energy. Who is here and excited to hear some stories tonight? Yeah. That's not usually the energy you get when a bunch of people get together and talk about money, is it? So thank you for being here. This is a fun experiment for us. We are doing a themed storytelling Vermont. We're here the first Tuesday of every month at 7.30, right here at the fantastic Light Club Lamp Shop, Church of Lamps, surrounded by lamps. And tonight we are doing stories on the theme of money in honor and support of CVOEO, the Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity. We're going to have some people uh, tell you a little mo more about them. We're also going to give away some free stuff from them. We have seven fantastic storytellers. And But let's, you know, money. It's kind of a taboo subject, right? I think there's uh, some embarrassment attached to it. And so I wanted to share with you that as an unusual part of my job, I go around and I ask people to share their embarrassing stories about money. And I've heard some great ones. And so if you have ever, hi, welcome. If you've ever screwed up horribly with money, I just wanted to say it to the people as they came in, um, you are not alone. Uh, and I've heard some pretty great stories of people who have been creative with very little financial opportunity. For example, um, I heard a story about someone who had a $1,000 Dodge Neon and drove that car for five years. And at the end of year one, snow caved in the roof of that car and the driver just punched out the roof and just kept going. Because, you know, you can't really <laughs> lower the value of a Dodge Neon. Um, I've heard some amazing stories. Uh, someone told this story about being in incredible amounts of debt. And she said, what you would not believe is that when you have $10,000 in debt, you cannot sleep at night. You are up all night. It's all you can think about. But when you have $100,000 in debt a year later, you sleep like a baby. <laughs> I thought that was fascinating. We did this event at the Monkey House last month, and a woman told an incredible story about getting involved in one of those kind of... Um, upsell, multi-level marketing, kind of creepy, um, pay for the $10,000 training and you'll be a millionaire in six months, those kind of things. And what's fascinating about this woman is she would say yes every time. So if you're the kind of person who was like, I smell a scam, you know, all my walls are up. It was fascinating to hear somebody be like, I was like, yeah, absolutely. And they took them out on a yacht and gave them the high life all this weekend, like free drinks. And they gave them a script so that they could call their credit card companies and raise their credit limit. Alcohol was obviously involved in that. And then, um, and then the cruise was done on a Sunday so that they'd already made the purchase. You know, credit card companies not open until Monday. So you hear these stories, you're like, oh my God. But the reason I share this with you is because when you hear stories like this, maybe you're like me and you feel like, oh, thank God. Right? I don't have to be perfect. They're, I'm surrounded by people who have learned the hard way. And that's one of my favorite things, sort of bubbles to pop when it comes to money, is we've all made mistakes. There is no judgment. There's no embarrassment. And tonight we're going to tell stories about how money shows up in all of our lives. And looking at the summaries, I am fascinated. We're going to hear all kinds of different perspectives. And to get us going, I want to bring up Forrest. Forrest is a financial counselor at CVOEO, and he's going to tell us a little bit more about them and then share with you what our free giveaways are going to be this evening. So, Forrest, there you are. Please welcome, I forgot, I'm sorry, I forgot your last name. Gardner. It is Gardner. Please welcome Forrest Gardner to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. So, yeah, th thank you everybody for being here tonight. This, I, I agree, this is a really great experiment. Um, we're really excited to be a part of this storytelling night. Um, and, and Colin, uh, it's a very good job saying our entire name. Uh, I'm not, not sure if I could do that after two years at CVOEO. But anyway, uh, so I'm with the Financial Futures Program at CVOEO. Um, as Colin mentioned, I'm a financial coach. 
Um, I work with people on a range of different um, money topics, right? But I'm just kind of curious, are folks uh, familiar with CVOEO and the work we do in the community? A little bit, maybe not. No, not really. Yeah, so, so we're a community action agency. We provide a number of different uh, social services, right? So the Chittenden Emergency Food Shelf is part of CVOEO. Uh, the local Head Start programs, um, the Champlain Valley Weatherization program are all, you know, examples of services we offer that, that people can come and access at, at, for free. Um, and so Financial Futures is one of those. Um, as I mentioned, you know, I do kind of a wide range of things. I work with people on credit building, um, on kind of looking at your monthly budget, figuring out where your money's going, planning around that. Um, helping people manage debts, right? Um, one that I see all the time is student debt and helping people strategize how they want to handle that. So we also offer um, business counseling services. So for people who want to start up a, a small business or maybe are already running one, um, you can get some assistance from us here too. Um, so, so a lot of different things we do. Uh, we teach workshops and all those topics. And I think Colin mentioned we have some, uh, some prizes tonight that we're going to give out via a process. I'm not sure what the process will be, uh, but Colin was very good at providing a process last time we did this. Uh, but, but they're uh, free financial coaching sessions. Um, we have three of them. Um, and so if, if, you, you know, if you hear some of this tonight, you think, ah, oh, this kind of inspires me to, to want to do something in this realm. Maybe you'll be lucky enough to get one of those. Um, so, so at any rate, uh, thank you for being here tonight. Um, I also want to thank, we have a representative from one of our um, grant funders here, Northfield Savings Bank, who's kind of checking this out. So it's great to see him here too. But uh, yeah, thanks for coming. I hope you enjoy the stories. And uh, here you go, Colin. Thank you, Forrest. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our first storyteller to the stage. So get ready to make this pre person feel really welcome. And uh, I, I, this story, I think you're really going to enjoy. So please welcome Annie Malo as our first. Here she's ready. She's ready. Please welcome Annie Malo. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there you go. So everything that I have ever needed to know about money, I learned from my hairdresser and my coworker Shirley. See, I used to work on Wall Street, uh, and uh, not, not actually on physically Wall Street. I actually worked in the World Trade Center uh, in the mid-90s, like in between terrorist attacks. And uh, I was not a broker. I, uh, I, I didn't even know that much about finance. I actually was a writer. I still am. And I was writing for the National Training Center for a large brokerage house, right? So I wrote uh, training materials and... Um, uh, reference materials and things like that. And so I was kind of one step removed from all of the crazy money stuff. Um, and, and I got to feeling like I was really kind of above it all, you know, which is delusional, right? Because you can't work in that environment. It's so crazy, Wall Street. You cannot work, like you cannot swim in a barrel of brine and not come out pickled, you know? Like you, you just can't. So um, I, you know, I, I, it just seeps into your bones in a way. And so, like, I remember walking to work through Tribeca and, and playing this brain game with myself of counting up how much money I was wearing on my body, right? Because you had to look the part when you worked in these places. So you'd be like, okay, I've got my $70 shoes and my $400 suit and my silk blouse and my jewelry and my trench coat. And, and then there's the maintenance. Um, it didn't matter if you were male or female. You worked on Wall Street. You were at the salon at least once a week. You're either having a man, man, women, man manicures, you know, uh, and then maybe every three, four weeks you go in and you get your hair just kind of touched up just to keep it looking good. Um, and my hair was so boring and so corporate. Um, it, it was blonde, blown out straight, shoulder length, bob, just cut. My hairdresser, on the other hand, was an artist, like a real artist, and he was also a great hairdresser and a colorist, and every time I went to see him, he would beg me. Wayne would say, Come on in, please. Let me cut your hair. Let me dye your hair. Please, please, please. And I say, no, no, Wayne. I got this job. I can't do that. Please, no, no. Finally, he wears me down. And I say, fine. Go ahead. Do whatever you want. And he gets really excited. He books me that night at the end of the day. I'm the last client in the joint. So I walk into the salon. The whole place is basically dark. The, you know, all of the manicures in the front have gone home. 
the other stylists are gone, and you know, it's just me and him and a pool of light over his, over his station, you know? So he gets me in the chair, and, um, and then he takes a cape and he throws it over the mirror, right? Because he wants to surprise me. He doesn't want me to see what he's doing. So he does that, whew, off comes the hair all over the floor. And then he starts mixing, you know, and he's mixing all these, and he's, and he's squirting and, and, you know, and foiling, and he's taking notes, and then he's setting timers, and then checking, the, you know, 20 minutes later, he's, oh, no, you're not, not going to like that. And he starts squirting some more. He gets all done, and finally, I am cut, I am colored, I am washed, I am dried, and he whips the cape off the mirror, and I look, and my hair is this short, short work of art. And I look like a natural born redhead. Like beautiful, like auburn with deep highlight, like perfect, I look like I was born, like my skin tone comes out, my eyes pop, I'm in awe. And then I go home and I start to panic, right? Because I've got to take this into work the next day. So I get up and I go into work, I come up in the elevator, I get out, and I, I go to walk past the front reception desk, and the receptionist says, oh, excuse me, ma'am, you can't go, holy shit! <laughs> you know, and it's, and it's this way all the way back to my office, and running the gauntlet. Everyone's like, oh my God, oh my holy, whoa, you know, until I round the corner, I got 20 feet to get to my door, and I walk past Shirley's desk. Shirley was also not a broker, um, Shirley was an institution. <laughs> she had been there forever. Um, she managed the entire support staff for the department. She was so smart and so funny. Shirley had also uh, been born in Jamaica, so um, she still had this Jamaican lilt and just a turn of phrase so that everything that Shirley said sounded even smarter and funnier than it already did. You know? And also Shirley claimed she was a grandmother. You have never seen a grandmother like Shirley, all right? We're talking just statue, broad shoulders and wasp waist and these exquisite tailored wool pencil skirts with a deep slit up the sky, never less than a three inch heel, you know, which she floated on. You know, she looked like Martha Graham when she was walking, you know? All right, so I go to walk past Shirley's death. Shirley looks up, she goes, oh, good morning, Anne and goes back to what she's doing. And I skid to a halt, and I turn around and say, wait a minute, Shirley, come on. Everybody else here has fallen off their chairs. What's up with this? And Shirley says, oh, Anne, I understand. You know, hair, it's like money. And I laugh, and she laughs, and I go back to my office, and I think about it. But 20 minutes later, I come out, and I go, all right, Shirley, what the hell did you mean hair is like money? So she tells me, she says, you know, you got to let it go. You got to let it grow. You cut it off. It grow back no matter what. Money, you let it go. It come back to you. As long as you have breath, she says, your hair, it's got to grow. Okay. A few months later, my father uh, has an aneurysm that bursts in his brain. Um, and so I... Um, I end up shuttling back and forth between New York City and Erie, Pennsylvania. You know, I'm spending um, three or four days in the office, and then I'm three or four days in the hospital, mostly being there for my mom. Um, you know, because the aneurysm, it's funny, the aneurysm did not kill him. Uh, what killed him was the surgery to correct the aneurysm, put him in a coma, and of course he never woke up. So this is weeks and weeks of this, and, um, and it's fine, really. You know, I'm very organized, my coworkers totally have my back. Um, you know, deadlines are being met, but my boss <clears throat> is slowly losing her mind. She's very old school. And, you know, she does not like the fact that I'm not there. If she, in her mind, if I'm not warming that chair from, you know, opening bells to close of market at the end of the day, even though I'm not even a broker, then there's something wrong and the, and the work's not getting done. And so this goes on for a number of weeks. I finally, I come back from sitting bedside after a long weekend, and I walk into the office, and she snaps. She says, I need to see you in my office. So I go into her office, and she says, okay, look, we need to talk. You, you need to make a choice. You need to decide between your family and your career. Oh. 
so I, I wait until the end of the day. Everybody leaves the office. And I very quietly pack up all of my personal belongings. And I go home. And I, you know, I leave all my work in order. I'm not going to screw my coworkers. I come back in the morning. And I put my resignation letter on my boss's desk. And she reads it. And she asks me to sit. And I sit. And she says, you know, I, I just have to tell you, I think you could be making a terrible, terrible mistake. And I think about it. And I say, yeah. Yeah, you know, you're right. I might be making a horrible mistake. And I slide the letter a little closer to her. And I get up. And I leave. Thank you. Keep it going for Annie Malo. Great story, Annie. Thank you. Man, wasn't that great? The courage to quit, and you still were like, I'm going to look cool doing it. You are not going to take that from me. <laughs> Slide it a little closer. I love that. Also, incidentally, do you know if Shirley has a personal finance DVD? Because I would buy that in a heartbeat. Shirley's three principles of money. Your money's like your hair. Let it go, let it grow, and it'll come back. But said with confidence, right? I would buy that for $19.99. Um, let's bring up our next storyteller who's telling for the first time here at Storytelling VT. Yes? Yeah. And uh, so let's make him feel extra welcome as he makes his debut, Ron Manganello. Come on up. folks close enough so um, when I saw that I had gone to one of these a few years ago and I got on the mailing list and when I saw that it was about money I said oh that's something that's like I'm really involved in so I will I will actually come and actually tell a story because it's about money and um, my background in money is that when I was a little kid, I would always have a paper route or sell Christmas cards. I was always like, money was always important to me. Our family was not wealthy, and uh, I had a savings account, and I had a coin collection. I'd get 100 silver dollars and look through them and all this kind of stuff. And then, then I became a hippie um, in the late 60s, and um, the thing I learned there in seven years of living in communes was to share. So as I kind of got married and had a kid and started like having a real job and all those kind of things, um, I always wanted to give. I mean, it was just wired in. You know, if there's a 12-step program, I didn't take it. You know, so I, I was like, when I was working for the city of Burlington, they had a United Way campaign, and I always gave more than anyone else, and it it didn't make sense to me, because I knew there were people that had a lot more money, but I just was wired that way. I couldn't help it, and I never got rid of it. So as, um, as I was working there, I also didn't want to work there until I was 65. So I said, what am I going to do? I don't have that many skills. How am I going to get out of this game at 55, which was my goal? So I said, well, my grandfather, all my grandparents came from Italy. And, and then had nothing, and one of my grandparents beca became a pretty successful real estate developer. My father and two of my aunts were part-time real, real estate salespeople. I said, well, I kind of know that game, and I think I can do that. I think I'm good with people, I'm good with my hands. So I got into that at a good time in Burlington, and I had a lot of dumb luck, which I'm, go I'm going to make a bumper sticker that says, dumb luck is my co-pilot, because I really believe that. So it was a combination of kind of having kind of a sense of it, how to do it, and, uh, and dumb luck. And I did really, really well. So I, I met my goal of, of leaving my day job at 55. 
And I kept buying properties because it just was easy to do at that point. I had equity lines, I could pull money, I could just make it happen. And I've tutored a lot of people on how to do that. So a bunch of my friends are pretty good realtors, uh, not realtors, pretty good landlords now. And, but um, I had accumulated some wealth that I never expected to accumulate. It wasn't in my history to do that. And I got concerned about it because um, what's gonna happen when I die? We have one kid, and our kid lives very frugally and doesn't need a big pile of money. So this, the standard model of you give your money to your children, not so much. You know, my money came from Vermont, and my child doesn't even live in Vermont. I wanted it to go back to Vermont. So I had the idea, well, it's property. So maybe the Champlain Housing Trust would like to get our property and turn it into affordable housing when we're dead. And we'll leave a little bit for our kid. We had something figured out for that. Um, so I met with them a couple times. It was a couple of good meetings. They said, well, it's a little confusing. You've got like 17 units that you're, uh, we don't know what to do. So we're going to put you together with the Vermont Community Foundation. And you can figure something out with them. Now, I kind of really knew and loved the Vermont Community Foundation because I started Bike Recycle Vermont as a volunteer when I left my day job. And they had given us a $10,000 grant at one point. I said, Shh. Okay, cool. So I had a couple of meetings with the Vermont Community Foundation. And on the second meeting, they said, well, we were talking to the land trust. They can't guarantee that if you donate your properties that they are going to be kept as affordable housing. I said, oh, huh. But we have another idea for you. So there's something called a, ch I have trouble saying this, charitable remainder unit trust. That's a tongue twister for me for some reason, a crut. And what that is, is you, um, doesn't have to be the Vermont Community Foundation, but there are different nonprofits that can deal, deal with this. So you donate something, cash is lovely for them. If it's something else, they turn it into cash. And then while you're alive, they give you a certain percentage of what's left in that at the end of the year. And then when you're dead, a certain percentage of that every year goes to charities forever. It becomes a perpetual fund. I said, whoa, sign me up. So it was complicated. Um, and But we set this trust up, donated properties. I became the initial trustee, which meant I continued to manage them and take care of them. Didn't own them anymore. And then I also became the realtor and sold them all. And at the end of all of that, you know, the work that was involved in maintaining uh, 15 units and the 60 or so tenants that I had and all that stuff turned into four times a year. They put money in our checking account. So that just kind of completed last fall, and I just started really feeling the benefit of that workload off of my life, and boy, do I appreciate it. And so anyway, um, if anyone wants to know anything about landlording, talk to me sometime. If anyone wants to know anything about child remaining unit trust, talk to me sometime. I love to promote things that work, and that's kind of like the most enjoyable thing in my life. So. Thank you very much. His first time, not bad, Ron Manganello. Thank you, Ron. That was a great story. Promote things that work, promote things that are good for the community, good for other people. It's awesome. Vermont Community uh, Fund Foundation, sorry, Vermont Community Foundation is an awesome organization that I know even though I just said their name wrong. So you have to trust me on that. So uh, this is a great storyteller and the summary of his story was pretty fantastic. So please welcome to the stage Dennis McSorley. Thank you. Um, I have old pants with new pockets. That's my only line. Um, speaking of which, uh, let me just give you a couple little things to plant in your head. Um, in Hamlet, Polonius says to Laertes, neither a borrower nor a lender be. And he's trying to teach the kid that you can't really take money or owe money to friends. It'll ruin the friendship. In scripture, in Timothy, one of the books, I, I don't read it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's often misquoted, like, for the love of money. It actually is... Uh, money is the root of all evil is the misquote. It's actually for the love of money leads to all evil. 
And this guy, Ben Franklin, who had so many things to say, so many things to do, so many things to invent, also said a penny saved is a penny earned. So keep that somewhere in the back file at. So I'm a newly minted special education teacher in Brooklyn, New York, and, uh, and I'm working. I have a newly minted, no pun intended, master's degree in something. And my friend Mitch and I have been assigned with these recalcitrant youth, six kids. They found six kids who had anger issues in Brooklyn. Can you imagine? And, and <laughs> they, put them, they put them in a room with us, and uh, we had no idea what to do. The cops would call these kids recalcitrant youth. Um, and here they were. Steven Suarez was, uh, he had a flip. He was a uh, flamboyantly gay 11-year-old boy. If they were bullying today, this kid would be on all the national uh, posters. So he was in there for who knows why. I guess he got picked on a lot before this was an issue. Rashad Mack, uh, who looked like he was in the spinners in one of those groups, he wore these like Nehru jackets. He, he had held off three uh, fully packed uh, New York City police cars with broken beer bottles, throwing it at him, calling him all sorts of bad names. Daryl Ash's mother was like a, a black power advocate, so Daryl, with a big fro and the comb in it, hated all white people, which I happened to be, and so did my little Jewish buddy, Mitch. Uh, Larry Williams was just a little sneaky little guy who would like kicking the kneecap and run and go, he did it, he did it. And Lenny Womble could do bird calls, and he also would pick your pocket clean, and he told me one day he had so much power that if he put his finger in the earth, it would stop spinning. Needless to say, and by the way, you had to call them children with emotionally handicapped just to let you know. You have, in other words, you have to say you're blind and prove you're blind to get funding for the blind. So you have to say you're a bad kid, emotionally handicapped kid behavior or something in order to get federal, state, and local funding for this program. And these kids didn't need to prove it. They were. They were the self-fulfilled prophecies. Uh, Daryl, um, did I name them all? Yeah. Yeah, Lenny, woman, and, and these are real kids, but I hope they don't sue me for mentioning their name here in Burlington. And um, so, you know, uh, they were throwing desks around. They would disappear. The principal said, I never want to see these kids ever. They were, one of them tried to burn the school down that we were housed in. And he said, like, J just keep them, lock them in the room, and please, don't even bring them to lunch. Bring the food into the room like you're in solitary confinement. And we had the other idea. We wanted to bring them out there, so we were just naive and stupid. So they run around fighting. They, they went into this uh, supply closet, broke every piece of chalk and destroyed every piece of staple removers, everything we had, just tore it apart, punched the shit out of each other. They would just flip things over. They'd run out of the building sometimes, and we had to go get them. There's some nods over here. People who work with these kinds of kids. So they weren't the kinds of kids who would say, like, may I go to the bathroom or, you know, how many know the answer to this one? None of that. None of that. None of that. And we, you know, we were naive. So I'm telling Mitch, who had a psychology thing, you know, they have this behavior modification thing, and I learned about this in graduate school, and, and, and food is the number one thing. So he says, well, we don't want to do that. I said, well, you know, people work for rewards. So we get um, uh, a box of raisins, a banana, a Granny Smith apple, a couple of other things, and put them right on the chalkboard and say, first three guys that sit in their seats, boom, come on up here. Well, it worked. It's like feeding time in our cage. And they, they, they oh, so there's only three things. So we start to put a fourth thing. We get it down to one sometimes. You know, we just, we're playing with them too. Because we don't know what we're doing. It starts to work for a while. And I said, you know, why don't we just up this to something else? And he said, like, what? And I said, well, they're doing this around different parts of the country. They're actually paying kids to do their work in the classroom with real money. And he said, well, you know, we can't afford that. We're not getting paid much. And I said, all right, let's. Let's make up money. So we, we, uh, we drew a bad, uh, it would never be a Disney copyright infringement, a mouse that looked like a mouse, and we wrote Mickey on it. We had Mickey, Mickey Mouse money. We drew about 50 of those. We went to the Rexograph machine, ran them off, cut them out after school, and we had a whole bunch of these things. So now we'd say it's a money period. It was a reading or something like that. You sit down, you get the piece of paper, I get the notebook, put the date on it, and sit up straight, and pay attention for like, what, a half an hour? It could be a big payoff. But a boom. <laughs> Start sliding a couple of Mickeys on them, you know? A couple of mouse things right on these guys. And, and it's, 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 you know, it's not working 100%, but it's working. So I said, look, and on, on Friday, one of us would go out to this store and get this junk. We'd get the paddle, we'd get the finger puzzle thing, we'd get the thing with the slide, you could do in there and word search puzzle, Batman comic book, a slice of pepperoni pizza, an apple turnover, a, a kite. And we put all of this shit in the bag, and we'd sit in the back of the room, we'd say, okay, it's, 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 it's uh, auction time. And they would come back to him, and they'd go, first thing up, apple turnover. The kids go like, 
forty dollars. Yeah, bam, you know, and yeah, fuck, I want that. And they're bidding each other out. So anyway, we would clean these kids out. We get all the money back. All the money came back, and um, and then some sometimes. And a couple of them were like, you know, I said, where's all your money? Well, here's what they were doing. They were doing what we've done with money. They're playing dice in the in, in the lunchroom. They're stealing off each other. Mr. Dennis, my money's missing. I said, where are you keeping it? You sure where are you putting it? It's in my desk. I go, really? Yeah, good. What do you want me to do? Yeah, keep an eye on it. You gotta put it someplace where nobody can find it but you. You know, like, you know, like you've been learning about somebody, you know, all these little lessons. So he goes, all right, you know, it's in the lunchroom, they're cutting cards and they're just, they're just robbing each other. And so, 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 um, but meanwhile, they're sitting still and they're in, the, they're, in the, they're in the desks and we're paying them. And this reward thing is starting to work, even though I'm feeling lousy about it, because I'm thinking, like, but I mean, I get a paycheck. You'll wait two weeks to get a check. Maybe this is part of, like, a, a system to learn about, you know, the way things go. You know, you do something, you get, you get this for it, you know. And they learned, um, not to drive us so crazy so much, but we learned that after a while we became, um, well, they could trust us. That we didn't need the money anymore. That they were willing to work with us just because we had shown that we would come back. We showed that we would be there for them. We showed them that, uh, you know, we kind of really cared about them, and that's what they really were looking for. They were really lost souls, these kids, and they were, you know, this whole thing was a front. And um, so, you know, to this day, I, I, uh, Mitch is uh, just like me, like we're, we're still friends, and we still talk about the Mickey Mouse money and all that stuff. So. You can decide where all that fits in with a penny saved, a penny earned, neither a borrower or a lender be, and all that kind of stuff. And I thank you for listening. Dennis McSorley. Let him hear it. Dennis McSorley. Nice. And it came back to your quotes, Laertes, and. Uh, uh, Polonius, and then the and then, but you didn't mention the Bible verse one again. You didn't come back to that. I love the way you brought that up. You were like, "It's in the Bible. I don't read it." But that's how you don't feel. We didn't feel preached. Did you feel preached too? I I feel very safe. <laughs> the way you brought up the Bible, I was like, "Oh, Bible. Oh, it's cool. We're fine." Uh, yeah, that was great, Dennis. Thank you so much. Fantastic story. So cool. You still remember all their names. Still think about those days. Yeah, <laughs> I bet they do. Let's bring up our next storyteller, and her name is Anne Lezak. Let her hear it. Some years ago, 10 years ago, in fact, my buddy, who I'll, I'll call Scott, whose book I'd edited, called me and said, I was at a conference, and I met the most amazing woman. She's written a memoir and I really hope that you'll edit it. So, you know, that was interesting, and I took her number, and I called her, Angela, in Kansas, and I had her send me a couple of her chapters, and I was hooked. Her writing was rough, but the memoir was indeed compelling. It was the story of how she'd had a really difficult childhood, had ended up an, a drug addict, had struggled with addiction for almost 20 years, and then had um, found recovery. So I, I knew that it would need a lot of editing and, and redoing, but there was definitely a real story there. As I got to really get into the book and know Angela, I learned her whole story. She had struggled with addiction since she was 15 or 16 years old. She had amazing strength, as well as just incredible tragedies in her life. She had periods when she was doing really well. She became a hairdresser. She went to college. She cared as a you know, very um, devoted mother to whichever children were in her home. And then through some combination of bad luck and bad choices, she would relapse. She would lose her job. She would drop out of college. She would find yet another bad to two-timing, drug-using boyfriend who abused her, and usually she'd get pregnant. She'd lose whichever kids she had in the home. She'd then, like, you know, decide that she was going to start over again with this new child. She'd go to rehab. She'd get clean again. And it, this went on and on. 
until she finally reached a really, really low point. She had lost all six of her children to the child welfare system. She was on a really bad addiction run and she ended up getting arrested for selling drugs and doing hard time in prison for about four years when somehow she was able to find the strength to actually manage her path to long-term recovery. By the time I was connected with Angela we, and became her virtual editor, we never met because she was in Kansas all the time. I was in Vermont. She had been in recovery for eight years. She'd reconnected with five of her six kids. She was a family advocate working for the state of Kansas. She was giving talks around the country. And she'd written a 300-page memoir, which I found pretty darn impressive. So I um, agreed to take on the book. I wrote a contract. As with my buddy Scott, I didn't ask for any money up front. Unlike with my buddy Scott, I knew that Angela was you know, living on a pretty slim line there and, and didn't have much money. So I made a deal, which I thought was pretty darn generous. I said that she would pay me one third of the contract amount when the book was written, and then the rest she could pay over 18 months as she supposedly you know, got money from the book. Angela was extremely grateful and so happy that I believed in her. And we had the best editing relationship. It really went swimmingly. We talked all the time. We emailed back and forth. She was very good about me making major changes just to tighten up the book and make it read better. By the end of it, she was absolutely delighted with the book. And I felt like it was a really solid book, too. When that book came out, she called me up crying and said, Anne, thank you, thank you for bringing my book to life and for believing in me. I'm so grateful. She sent me a copy of the book, and I almost cried myself. It was, of course, autographed, but she had just written an absolutely beautiful preface giving me incredible credit for the work on the book. So I was feeling pretty good, and I sent my invoice and didn't hear back for a long time. Another you know, couple months went by, and I emailed Angela, and I said, Angela, you know, one-third of the price is, is due now. She wrote me right back, and she said, oh, Anne, I'm sorry, I've had a couple of really hard months. I'll be paying you immediately. Nothing. Silence. Another month goes by. I email again. Angela, you know, I really worked hard on this book. I'm expecting the payment. Oh, I know, I know. This is, I, I feel terrible. I'm sending you the money. I'm sending you the money. This went on for several months. Finally, at about five months, I got a $25 check. Another few months go by, nothing. And I'm starting to get angry and feeling used. And my emails take on an entirely different tone. And I email her and I say, Angela, I'm really feeling betrayed here. I gave you my blood, sweat, and tears. I worked so hard on this. I worked way more than I ever expected to. You have this beautiful book. You're selling the book on Amazon. I really expect to be paid. Well, this went back and forth a few times until silence on her end. In the final, like, low, you know, when I reached my low point, I threatened to take her to small claims court, which she and I both knew was an empty threat because I learned that I would have to travel to Kansas and spend three days there, which would have pretty much cost me what it cost, you know, the whole price of the book. So I gave up after that. I was really pretty angry and disappointed, and I, obviously, you can tell in my voice, I still am. Years and years went by, and I don't know what it was, but something reminded me of Angela one day. And I just went and looked her up on Facebook. And there she was, selling her book, giving talks around the country, serving as a consultant for the federal government. And her Facebook page was full of hearts and flowers and beautiful, you know, those wonderful sayings, treat each one as you wish to be treated, you know, all these beautiful things. And oh my God, I almost, I just saw red. And before I knew it, I was writing her a really mean Facebook message. <laughs> Angela, it's me, Anne. I can't believe you never paid me. How can this be? I am so angry still all these years later. Was I ever surprised when 20 minutes later, a long message comes back to me. Anne, you won't believe this, but I was just thinking of you. <laughs> I don't believe it. <laughs> I have been through such a difficult few years, 
and I'm just coming out of it, and I feel so guilty and so terrible. This is not the person I am. I don't want you to think of me this way. I'm going to start paying you immediately. Please send me your address if you've moved. I had moved. And I hope with all my heart that you will forgive me once I pay you back. Wow, I was surprised. I sent her my address. And I said, I will forgive you if I get paid back. <laughs> and that was our last interaction exactly one year ago. Thank you. <laughs> what a nail biter. Oh, Ann Lee Zach. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was all hanging on that last line. Oh, good job, Ann. That's, that's not what you deserve for that experience, but it was a great story. Uh, a couple of announcements. There are some other events coming up. Raseel Hamrell. Where's Raseel? Stand up. Raseel. Oh, sorry, Raseel right here. Uh, you must know Raseel. She is a wonderful, wonderful lady. And she hosts a monthly event, third Tuesday every month, at, the, at Shelburne Vineyard. So it's this May 16th, and it uh, starts at 7.30. And she has these fantastic handouts. So if you want one, um, they get a great crowd, and there's obviously great wine, and it's a cool environment. So... Uh, go talk to Raseel. If you haven't met her, you should just say hi, because she's, isn't it nice to just meet a joyful person? And that's what I think of when I think of Raseel. Uh, upcoming events, May 12th, we have Extempo at Highland Lodge. I'm literally reading this. I don't even know where that is. Where is that? Is that in central Vermont somewhere? Where? In Greensboro. Okay. May 9th, uh, the moth is at Arts Riot. June, we are not going to do. So next month, we're not going to do Storytelling VT because we have Jazz Festival the same day. But um, you have Raseel's event May 16th, and there's another one in June on the 21st. And we will be back in July. So if you like this, there's like four more stories. We're not done. I just wanted to get through these. Um, if you like this, you can sign up or go on our Facebook, which is slash StoryVT. And we'll just let you know what the themes are going to be for the next one. It's not usually a hard theme like this. It's usually optional uh, prompts you can use. And it's always a lot of fun. And we love being here at the Lamp Club. Can we uh, thank the Lamp Club for hosting us? Please thank your bartender. Through applause and through tips. Those are the two, two ways. So thank your bartender. Sometimes logic goes together with money. Most of the time, they are not even remotely related. That is true. If your company offers matching or retirement savings, or as they call free money, definitely look into that. Definitely do not wait a whole year to bring it up again because the HR lady at your company was super mean to you when you asked. <laughs> That's just like a hypothetical I just brought up out of nowhere. I'm sure we can all relate to that. Right? You, got, you deserve to ask those questions, you deserve to understand so that you can get started on saving for your retirement and your future. Let's bring up another storyteller, and I'm, uh, oh, it, it is Peter. <laughs> I put my list away, and he's sitting right here. Um, Peter Burns is always a pleasure to have as part of our Storytelling VT. I know you're really going to enjoy him, so please welcome to the stage, Peter Burns. <laughs> As a child, I was part of a complex economic system, which included hunting and gathering, <laughs> scavenging, the black market, and both formal and informal cash-based transactions. We weren't very impressive hunters. We killed a few snakes and birds, but we never consumed them. We were much better a gathering. We ate blackberries, blueberries, black raspberries, um, grapes, apples, and wild chives. 
We scavenged building materials for tree houses and forts. When I was a teenager, black, uh, when I was a teenager, drugs entered the black market, but as a child, we were mostly interested in fireworks. <laughs> Salutes were the most versatile. They came in packets of 20. They were made in China and they had names like Red Dragon and Blue Devil. We used them to make water bombs, mini cannons, and exploding crab apples. <laughs> Alan Elby was our paper boy. He had one of the few paying jobs for children in my neighborhood. My parents liked him. They said, he has kind eyes. But I knew he was a vicious bully. <laughs> One day, Alan said to me, Burns, I'll give you a gross of salutes for eight bucks. That was a great deal. <laughs> a gross is 144 packets of salutes. To me, it was almost unimaginable wealth. I said, I don't got eight bucks, but maybe I could save it up. My allowance was 25 cents a week, <laughs> which I could supplement by returning bottles. So it took me about two months to get the eight dollars. I told him, and he said, I'll meet you tomorrow, edge of the sand pit. Remember, eight fucking dollars, asshole. He wasn't the greatest salesman of all time. <laughs> but he had a product that he knew I wanted. So I met him the next day at the appointed place and time. And he took the $8 and he counted it very carefully and he put it in his pocket. And he gave me a paper bag with 10 packets of salutes. And I said, hey, Alan, you said a gross, that's 144. And he said, Take it or leave it, asshole. And of course, I had to take it because he could have easily beat the crap out of me. And fireworks were illegal, so I couldn't tell my parents. There was also an unwritten code that kid business and adult business were entirely segregated. So I took the 10 salutes, I had 10 packs of salutes. I didn't even really enjoy them. Um, I felt sick. I felt, I felt uh, overwhelmed with sadness by this deal that had gone bad. I lived in Providence, Rhode Island from 1961 to 1974. And during that time, my neighborhood was essentially destroyed. Drugs moved in, more affluent people moved out. Eventually there were deserted houses and fires. Was this all Alan Elby's fault? <laughs> Sometimes I think so, but then, then I think no. His actions, his betrayal of that childhood trust, that trust that if you say you're gonna give a kid 144 salutes for eight bucks, you'll give it to him. His betrayal was, was kind of a, a reflection of a greater societal betrayal because in my neighborhood, which was uh, dominated by a woolen mill, during my grandfather's time, it was possible, if you worked hard, to make a decent living. But as the woolen mill closed, as good jobs left, that became impossible. So although I still think there is hope, I still think that it is possible to make a good living, a lot of things have to change. Thank you. I do have an addendum. Um, you'll, was anyone here last month when I told the story? Yeah. Well, you'll notice that uh, the last month's story was about uh, five red Chinese dragons. And many of you, of course, noticed that there was a red Chinese dragon in this story. I'm sure. So I've decided to make that a tradition. 
So next time I tell a story here, I'll make a reference to this story. And it'll be you know, pretty simple to pick out if you're paying attention. For example, I might put Napoleon in next month or the month after that story. And you'll think, oh yeah, Napoleon in 1814 was on the Isle of Elba. And so you'll say, Alan Elby, Isle of Elba. And it'll all come together. I'll know you'll be looking forward to that. Thank you. That's going to be fun. I look forward to that. Peter Burns. Peter Burns takes the detail part of storytelling to an incredible new level is setting a new bar for us um his 12 stories this year will all be interlocked and cascading and he'll release a sort of silmarillion-esque decoder novel for the super fans <laughs> um i was thinking about uh ann's story about uh, betrayal another theme that came up and i, I wanted to mention ann that i also as a freelancer, wrote copy for a website for a guy who promised to pay me and did all the copy and then s sent it to him and he, d he d like disappeared. I have this business card. It's like the only remaining <laughs> vestige of this. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. And so it's like, it's, I just wanted you to know. I mean, it's, it's, I think I saw a lot of nods. It's a very relatable thing. And it's unfortunately how you learn, right? If you're a freelancer, you got to look out for yourself and get your deposit up front. Yeah, and this is how we know. And so thank you again for telling. And I wanted to give you this for you or for somebody who you think, because this is great financial coaching and we could all use this. You keep an eye out for somebody who would like this. The anonymous part is the best part, which you've <laughs> rolled right through. No, it's totally, it's totally cool. It's something we can all benefit from, so I hope you will check out. Is it cvoeo.org? Yes. yes, okay, I, I assume so. cvoeo.org, be sure to check them out. And let's bring up our next storyteller. We have two left. Our next storyteller uh, has been involved with this organization for a long time, helped found it, has been a big supporter of storytelling, both orally and also through RETN. So please welcome Jin Ferrara. <laughs> because I was sort of overwhelmed by everything. I know, really, I, I am. It's really great to be here. Um, oh, did I do something? Everyone knows I have this like horrible problem with the microphones. I always am like, oh, yeah, I'll adjust that for you. And it's like, <laughs> all right. So, so um, education is really, really important to me. Um, I think it's up there with, you know, once you got your food and your shelter, it's, it's what you have to have. It's, it's what makes life worth living. It's what makes us civilized. It's, it's also what makes life fun. And all right, I come from a family of educators, so maybe that's partially why I feel this way. Uh, you can go back to my great aunt Josephine. She was a kindergarten teacher in Brooklyn. And my dad was my middle school principal. Yay. And, um, and, I, and I actually followed along. I got into education, too, um, but in a kind of different way. They were all public school educators, and I went into media education, mostly after-school programs, nonprofits. But I get to work a lot with public schools, which I still feel like I'm touching back into the family heritage. Um, and when I was in Baltimore, where I lived there for about 20 years, and I did these media education programs there and after school with young people where they would, we basically taught the technical skills and then they would take the skills and tell stories about things that matter to them. And it was a really, really broad array of stuff. We were middle school through high school. They were talking about fashion, romance, bullying, technology. And then they were talking an awful lot about their school experience. And just to give you some context, the number of kids in Vermont who go to public school is the same 
number of kids who go to public school in Baltimore City. All right, this is a gigantic school system and a very, very under-resourced one. Like so bad that a judge had actually ruled that the state owed the city like tens of millions of dollars that they were like way, way off in their budget and they had to be paying it back on a yearly basis, but they weren't. And uh, you know, young people are really smart. They figured this stuff out. They knew they were owed money. And first they did some speaking at the gov you know, to the governor and writing letters, and, and then they started organizing, like for real. And they did this student walkout where like, all these high school students came, like hundreds and hundreds of kids came and gathered at City Hall in just this mass. And my students came and filmed them. So they were making a documentary about all the student organizing that was happening. And they were doing this thing called a die-in where they were just lying on the ground with like red duct tape on their chests. And they had these signs that said, no education, no life, because they really clearly got that they were being cheated out of a future by not getting an adequate education. The documentary did really well. It got screened all over the country. It really helped the young people who were featured in it move on to do other interesting things. It did not move the state to bring more money to the city. Years pass, I get old, my husband gets old, we realize we really, maybe it's time to shift gears. Uh, we wanna start a family, we wanna be near some other family, so we move up to the Northeast and we find this really amazing community where the schools are valued so much that they're in the top 10 in the state and, and it just seems like this wonderful environment to start a family. I moved to South Burlington. <laughs> yeah, so I th I'm hearing some of you maybe read the newspaper or Facebook or Twitter, or pretty much anything or know someone, <laughs> um, anyone, and you know that we've just voted down our school budget for the second time. And I mean, I, I literally don't have the words for that. Education to me is where you put your money, number one. And you know, I, I get, it gets me down. And sometimes I look at it and I go, gosh, it's, it's just like Baltimore. And then I'm like, <laughs> okay, calm down. <laughs> it is not just like Baltimore. That, that was an, an under-resourced under school system in an under-resourced city. This is a one of the like wealthiest cities in the state if you look at the census like there's money here there's a lot going on here the students are going to be all right but the thing that's the same is that there were some adults in baltimore who made it really clear that education and young people were not their priority and there are some adults in south burlington who are right now doing the same thing and in both cases the young people totally know it. And you know, the good thing is that like learning happens kind of no matter what. All those young people in Baltimore who'd never got the great funding, like they're, a lot of them are doing amazing things. Some of my former students are filmmakers, some of them are teachers. One of those guys I know is doing national organizing. This stuff really pays off. But uh, I think that these lessons, you know, about how we behave and how we treat each other are really gonna matter down the road. So I'm crossing my fingers that the third budget that gets, gets approved and people vote yes. And then you know we can focus on the big things like our gigantic crime problem. <laughs> Thanks. Nice job, Jen. Jen Ferrara. You ended on a punchline with the phrase gigantic crime problem. That's hard to do. Well done. You got a laugh out of that. I could have gone a different way. Thanks for telling that story, Jen. Uh, we have one final. I'm going to tell you a story tonight uh, about one of my first jobs. And um, I left college with a dream 
to get, become a paid novelist and writer. I want to get paid to write. And this is how I made $12,000 doing that. Uh, I became a journalist for a small town newspaper. So small that I walked into the interview and I walked out with three articles due. <laughs> and like no experience. And uh, it was a weird model. I mean, it was cool. It was kind of like you get, it was the whole be your own boss pitch. You know, you don't, there's no office. You don't have to come to an office. You can work wherever. There was a ton of variety because I would go to all these different locations to interview people and take photos. Here's the economics of being a small town reporter. Uh, I got paid $30 per article. If I took a photo, and they used it, I would get paid 15. <laughs> and uh, I was paid as a contractor, 1099, so there were no t health insurance, there were no taxes taken out. And uh, <laughs> so in order to make about, I, was, I worked out, I had a system so that I could make about $300 a week, which meant I had to write eight to 10 articles every single week. And I was looking back at a list of some of the articles just to refresh my memory. Some of them are like, Phew. you read the title and you're like, pass. I don't, why would I even want to know more? <laughs> it's like, city discusses options on road. <laughs> and then I wrote, somehow I turned that into a story. <laughs> Wouldn't you know it at the end, nothing was decided. Um, <laughs> So there was just all this kind of stuff that way, but I, I don't want to make fun of it because I totally loved meeting all the people I did and getting to tell their stories. And I kind of loved the financial challenge of it. I mean, remember I said I made $12,000 as a writer? That was in the first year. So like in a year, that was a salary. I just want to be clear. It wasn't like I <laughs> got that all in one lump sum. That was like... 10 months worth of work, <laughs> something like that. So, you know, I'm living at the poverty line, and I, but I have this brain where I, I like to be frugal. I'm like, I think I can figure this out. So I came up with all these ways to drop my expenses so that I could continue to do this thing I really enjoyed. So um, I figured out how to make pad thai. I, I called it poor man's pad thai. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this. It's just ramen and peanut butter. <laughs> and like sriracha, like a little bit of spice. <laughs> I'm hearing judgment, I don't know why. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was the vegetable component. I, um, I had this Dodge Neon and um, the roof caved in with snow. <laughs> I just punched it out and kept driving. It was a callback from the beginning of the evening. I didn't know if that would work. This was also around the time that um, Google Voice was coming in to play. I mean, this is not that long ago, but it's amazing how fast technology changes. So w you could call through your computer for free, right? But my computer was too old to handle the, <laughs> the high volume of a phone call. And so I would do a variety of pay-by-the-minute phone plans, and I would call people, and all I'd be thinking about was the price <laughs> of the phone call. So I called this guy as a Vietnam vet, and he'd written a autobiography about his time in Vietnam. And I asked him one question, and he proceeded to speak uninterrupted for 18 minutes. <laughs> and after 18 minutes, I was like, I got to stop you, sir. I have 300 words that I can write about our conversation, which was not fun to sort of deliver that. And also, <laughs> like, this call has cost me what I will make on this article. <laughs> Somehow, <laughs> I have a horrible phone plan. One thing that was fun is I talked to a lot of kids, which was uh, always entertaining. I went on a hunger walk with uh, some students at a middle school, and I would kind of interview them, why are you here? One little girl said, I'm, I'm on this walk for hunger because of my dog, because he's always hungry. <laughs> I was like, you do not know what this is about. I, that's an amazing interpretation of this. I wrote a stirring review of uh, a middle school play called Romeo and Juliet, colon, Ninjas versus Pirates. Um, I did also write an article about the mathletes who were about to go off to a competition, which is just adorable. And you're like, I wish that my writing an article could give you some rock star-ness, but it's not going to. There's nothing I can do with mathletes. 
You just got to get older. I couldn't make anyone rock stars, actually. I did an article on local bands that had been performing for a long time, and I went and saw this band perform, and they were like a Bon Jovi style, like the, pff, the lights and the super tight pants, right? I did this interview with them, and then they said, who is this for? And, I, and it, it was for an over 50 magazine, and they were so crushed. And I was so crushed. I was like, I want to be from Spin right now, and I'm just not. I just need to make some money. They were like, could you not put our ages in the article? I was like, I get why you would ask that, but that's like the only reason I'm here is because you're over 50. Um, that was a painful conversation. There were some beautiful moments too, though. I remember there was this woman on the school board, and she was always very kind of cold and expressionless, and she got in a lot of conflict with people in the community, and I didn't know what that was about, and I, I got to write a profile on her, and I had this image of her, and I remember sitting with her in an elementary school, sitting on these little, this little bench, right, little elementary school-sized bench that are like knees jutting up in the air, and listening to her just geek out about teaching young girls robotics. And it was just the most beautiful thing, and I realized, like, you just, whip past people so quickly, especially when you're trying to make the $30 an article model work, that sometimes you forget that you can glimpse into a whole person. You can see this deep ocean of life experience and thoughtfulness. And I remember once I felt that, I just kept feeling that. I wrote down a few other examples. I, I did a story about a woman who writ, wrote a uh, book about her son dying from a drug overdose at like 20 years old. And because he died of a drug overdose, the newspapers had made it a whole thing, like a whole topical thing. And I just wanted to know her story. And she wrote me this long letter afterwards and said, you're the first press person who came to me and just cared about what I've been through. And that's when I started to feel like I was being, these things were seeping into my life, right? I was being touched by these people. And I met this math teacher who had somehow managed to teach three generations of the same family during his career as a math teacher. And he was super excited about the math of how that is even possible <laughs> to like an 18 year old goes through his class, has a child, she becomes 18, has a child. They all went through his class. He, he did a whole breakdown on it and <laughs> asked me to print it. My one uh, last claim to fame was that I wrote an article about Lisa Loeb. Um, if anyone remembers the 90s and remembers Reality Bites, <laughs> if anyone's ever heard of radio ever, then you know Lisa Loeb, of course. And uh, the one hit wonder, uh, Stay, was her song. I'm not going to sing it, but I'm seeing some, some nods. Anybody? Yeah. <laughs> Is it going to happen? No, I can't, I can't tell if it's going to happen. I can keep moving. <laughs> And so I got to interview her. She was playing at like the local, uh, you know, live venue. And she's like a famous person and I'm literally nobody. And I called her on the phone and I had to ask her, my editor asked me to ask, what's it like being famous for one song <laughs> from like 15 years ago or something like that? I don't know if you can get this from me, but I'm not that kind of reporter. And so I asked her in a very polite way, and I had this kind of nice conversation with her, and I said, I, I, I just am curious, what's, what's your perspective on this song? And she's, she said, you know, that song, I'm so grateful for it. Because of that one song, I have got to do a whole life of creativity and exploration and making people happy. And it was just like, she just dropped this bomb of just brilliance on me, and I thought, God damn it, Lisa Loeb, <laughs> right? It was this is great, great moment, and so, when I think about that job, I, I think that despite the horrible pay, I was a tourist in other people's passions. And for two years, the next year I didn't make 12,000, I made 30,000, but that was because I also had a 20 hour a week office job. <laughs> so, which I did two days a week, and they were like, what else do you do? Do you just sit at home? And I was like, no, I'm the head writer of a newspaper. <laughs> That's why I work here, because the pay is so bad. So I made $30,000, and I thought to myself, it was very emotional. I was like, I've done it. I've made what I made at my first shitty job before that. And then um, tax time came. <laughs> And I paid $4,000 in taxes. <laughs> so that was sad. But I will say... <laughs> When I think about that experience, what I think about mainly 
was that if we take the time to listen, then everyone around us has a story. And if you really look and really ask and really care, you realize that you and the people around you are all kind of fascinating. And that was worth $4,000 in taxes. That's my story. Thanks. All right. Uh, this has been great. Welcome. We're just starting. We're not. It's over. Uh, thank you so much all for being here. We uh, Did I distribute all three? No, I didn't. So now that we have talked about how cool it is to get advice about your financial situation, ask some questions, would anybody like a free coaching session with Forrest? Yeah? You were the first hand I saw. Way to put your hand up. Here you go. Come on up and, and grab it. I can't, I can't reach you. You guys, I want to thank all of you for being here. Please check out CVOEO, and let's thank RETN is filming this tonight. Thank you. And so these will be online at some point. I'm sure we'll post them on Facebook. I just want to say, as always, it feels really like a special thing happened tonight. Thank you for being here. First Tuesday of every month. Next first Tuesday, go to Jazz Fest. The first Tuesday in July, come back here at 7.30. We'll see you then. No, not at all. Have a great night. Thanks.